Hi guys, welcome back. This is episode number 41, featuring an interview with Bob Jacob, co-founder of Cinemaware. Now, if the name Cinemaware doesn't ring any bells for you, you have my sympathy, friend, <laughs> because that probably means you didn't have a Commodore Amiga, and for that you have my greatest sympathy, because you really missed out. Uh, the, the Amiga was a kick-ass, kick-ass platform. I, uh, it's, I find it very difficult to convey how exciting it was uh, the first time I loaded up Defender of the Crown and saw that game running on the Amiga 1000. Uh, I'd come to uh, the Amiga from the Commodore uh, 64. Now, to give you some idea of what this was like, imagine going from a Nintendo Entertainment System and, uh, and with that, with no transitions, leaping directly from that to an Xbox. <laughs> and that's what it felt like. This, whoa! I mean, uh, it wasn't just a small step, like from the Xbox to 360, from the PS2 to the PS3. I mean, this was a huge flying leap, and it wasn't just uh, the better graphics. As the CinemaWare's games demonstrated, this was a this was a new medium. Uh, there were new things you could do with this. Uh, you could you could have different kinds of games, different uh, types of gameplay, uh, different ways to tell stories. And uh, CinemaWare, uh, uh, their big idea, their their uh, sort of central theme was to take um, elements from television and movies and try to integrate them into the games in a very uh, fun and effective ways. And, you know, of course you think this is easy enough to do today. We have the hard drives, we have the CD-ROM, the DVD-ROM, we have all this, all this cool video compression techniques. I didn't have that um, in the 80s, or at least not when these games were being released. Instead, you had to have graphic artists that to go in using programs like Deluxe Paint and, uh, you know, basically use uh, these put together enough pixels and enough uh, with enough colors and such to actually make an image that looked as a photo or cinematically uh, realistic as possible. Quite an achievement. Uh, but I think what's even cooler about this is the fact that it was artists uh, working on this instead of just guys who out there with their digital cameras or whatever. They actually have a lot of personality uh, to the games. There's, there's a wonderful style to these games that just, uh, for me, just sucks me right in. I, I, I love all of their games. All right, so anyway, Mr. Jacob had some fantastic things to say, some very interesting things about the story behind these games. Uh, so without further ado, here's Bob Jacob. The industry was still in its infancy back then, right? And uh, games looked pretty lousy. The graphics weren't very good. Uh, most of the games were, were designed by programmers. I didn't really have a strong mass market consumer sensibility to the and, you know, I was a hardcore gamer myself, um, but I developed certain concepts for what I liked about games, okay? And I wasn't seeing it in the computer games that I bought, right? I mean, I was a fanatic arcade game player, right? And, you know, I, I realized that there were certain things about playing arcade games I wanted to bring to the home marketplace, okay? I also decided that movies would be a great motif, a great creative motif for doing games. People like movies, right? It, it gave us a, a virtually inexhaustible you know, supply of ideas. And I, and I, I was, I think, um, smart enough and cynical enough, if I can say that, you know, to realize that all we had to do was, was reach the level of copycat. And we'd be considered breakthrough. So, you know, the, the original genesis for Defend of the Crown was actually pretty simple. I, I, it was my original concept. Uh, I didn't design the game, but I knew, I knew pretty much what I wanted to do with it. Um, essentially, I, I, I took the game Risk. Okay? The, I loved Risk, the board game, when I was a kid, right? The whole idea of conquering territories. And I thought, well, what, what we should do in a game is let's re replace uh, the dice rolling in Risk with your success or failure at various action sequences in the game. And 
up until that time in games, action sequences lived and died by themselves. That they weren't in the context of the story. So if there was something revolutionary involved there, it was the idea of incorporating action into a game where your success or failure actually did have an effect on, on the story and how, how it progressed. The other thing that we, I threw in there was um, a little bit of you know, RPG, you know, with a small, you know, and, you know, not in caps, right? But you know, a, a, a small role-playing element, the action sequences, uh, we put the player under time pressure which I tried to do in most of the games at Cinemaware, right? And we came up with a hybrid kind of a game uh, that, that looked great. Uh, I was able to get Jim Sachs, who was the, the, the artist for like almost all the scenes in Defender of the Crown. Um, and he was just a fantastic, amazing artist. Uh, and, and the results spoke for themselves. We were also fortunate in a way, too, that the Electronic Arts came out with the Lux Paint. And that paint package was really critical to our success because, um, uh, you know, our, our best-selling games were not on the Amiga; they were actually on, on the Commodore 64. And you know, but we could take the the uh, you know the 320 by 200 graphics that we did on the Amiga and convert them down to, to basically 160, right, by 200 on, on, on the Commodore 64, and just by removing every other pixel. And the results were, were astonishing. So it would, uh, a whole bunch of things came together. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, you know, I was a movie buff. You know, what can I tell you? And, you know, I really wanted to uh, add a sense of romantic byplay to our games, you know, because no one had done it. I, I mean, the whole idea of trying to add a little bit of, Sex with a minor S, okay. In there, that was new. I mean, no one never pulled it off before. But I, but I think it helped. It just helped the vibe of the game. You know, it, it was just it was something I was interested in, in doing. And you know what? I always liked chesty women. So what the hell? We just went for it. <laughs> the Three Stooges. Uh, you know, I thought it was a slam dunk. I mean. Uh, I, I, you know, Columbia Pictures uh, uh, basically was a licensing agent for the rights holders who, uh, it was essentially Joan Maurer, who was Mo Howard's daughter. And, um, you know, I really wanted to do a game that was 100% pure to the license, okay? And, and that was the only goal we had. The game was designed by John Cutter who was involved with all the, all the Cinemaware stuff. And uh, it was John's idea, basically, uh, you know, he, he designed it as a, essentially as a board game that we brought to the computer, right? Uh, it had some great, I thought, digitized voices in the game. All the arcade scenes in the game came directly from their movies. They were based on famous bits from the Three Stooges and things. You know, um, it was incredibly successful. I, I was drawn to it because graphically it was far superior to anything else in the world. Uh, and, and I really thought it was going to be a successful hardware platform. You know, it, it, it had a limited uh, success here in the U.S. It was much more successful in Europe, okay? And w actually, most of our games, probably the majority of the cinema titles, at least in the Amiga, were, were sold in Europe, okay? Um, Commodore was a notoriously bad managed company. Uh, you know, I mean, the original you know, owner of the company uh, got rid of the Tremiles because he, he thought that they could only take it to a certain size. He wanted to grow it bigger. It ultimately, he ended up destroying the entire company in, in, in one way. Um, you know, it was, if the Amiga had taken, if the Amiga had really taken off, it would have been great for us. But it, it never did. We were kind of late as a company, I think, making the move to the PC. Um, and what really killed Cinema more than anything else, actually, was um, yeah, I made the, at the time, seemed brilliant decision to sell 20% of the company to NEC, the Japanese company. And it, it sounds great when you have this big Japanese partner. The problem was, was that you know, NEC came out with the TurboGrafx-16. And that's all for this week's Match Chat, but remember... 
Don't forget the popcorn.